total solar eclipse on April 8th. One last chance to capture Comet Pons Brooks and the start of galaxy season. All of this and more in today's episode of Widow's Astro Forum. After recording this video, I received the deeply saddening news of Alan Wallace's passing. I didn't know Alan in person, but his passion for landscape astrophotography and his ability to capture the beauty of the night sky in landscape photography have left a memorable mark on the world. Through his work, he not only showcased the magnificence of the universe, but also inspired countless others to look up and appreciate the wonders of the night sky. While his physical presence may no longer be with us, his legacy will continue to shine brightly through the beautiful photos he shared and the lives he touched. My heartfelt condolences go out to his family, friends and all of those who were fortunate enough to have crossed paths with him. Alan Wallace will be dearly missed, but his spirit will live on through the stars he so passionately immortalized. Hi folks, welcome to the video. April 2024 will be an exciting month for astrophotographers. By now you probably know all about the solar eclipse that is about to happen on April 8th in parts of Mexico, the United States and Canada. Now, capturing a solar eclipse can be a thrilling experience, but it also requires careful planning and the right equipment to do so safely and effectively. So let me start this episode by giving you five tips to help you capture stunning images of a solar eclipse. Tip number one, use a proper solar filter. Directly viewing or photographing the sun without adequate protection can cause permanent eye damage or damage to your camera equipment. Use a solar filter specifically designed for photography or eclipse viewing to safely capture the sun during the event. I personally use an 18 mm Bader solar filter in front of my telephoto lens to safely observe and capture the sun with my mirrorless camera. Tip number two, choose the right equipment. To capture detailed images of the eclipse, use a DSLR or mirrorless camera with a telephoto lens with a focal length of at least 300 millimeters. I personally use my 100 to 400 millimeter Tamron lens, which works well for close-up shots of the sun. You want to keep your camera stable on a sturdy tripod and use a remote shutter cable or a remote app to avoid shaking the camera when taking pictures of the sun. If you're using a tripod, you'll need to reposition it every few minutes as the sun moves across the sky. If you want to avoid that, you can also use a star tracker like the Skywatcher Star Adventure 2i Pro for automatic tracking. Alternatively, you can consider using smart telescopes like the Seastar S50 or the Dwarf 2, which can find and track the sun automatically, which eliminates the need for repositioning the tripod. For more information on capturing solar eclipses using DSLRs and smart telescopes, check out this video where I tested various equipment for capturing the sun. Tip number three, plan your location and timing. It's wise to research the path of the total eclipse in advance and choose a location with a clear view of the sun. It may be wise to arrive early to set up your equipment and familiarize yourself with the surroundings. In today's world, we have smartphone apps and online tools to determine the precise timing of the eclipse phases, including the partial phase, totality and the end of the eclipse. Now, personally, I recommend using time and day.com. This website offers a feature where you can zoom in on Google Maps and select your desired observation location for the eclipse. It provides an accurate simulation of how the eclipse will appear from that spot, complete with precise timings for each phase. Tip number four, experiment with your exposure settings. Now, of course, finding the right exposure settings for your equipment is crucial for capturing well-exposed images of the solar eclipse. I would start off with a low ISO level to minimize noise in your images and adjust your shutter speed accordingly. For example, with my Tamron lens at 400 mm at f6.3, an ISO of 100 and a shutter speed of 1 800th of a second works great for imaging sunspots of the sun. Now, a few seconds before totality, you may want to reduce your shutter speed to about 1 1,000th of a second to attempt and successfully photograph the famous Bailey's beads that are visible a few seconds before and a few seconds after totality. Now, during totality, you want to increase your exposure time to about 1 15th to 
half of a second to capture the large painter corona around the sun. Tip number five, capture the eclipse in context. Now, of course, these close-up images of the sun will be impressive, but you can also consider to incorporate the surrounding landscape or interesting foreground elements into your picture to create context. Also, a wide field shot of the sky may be very interesting, as Venus will be visible as a bright star just below the sun, and Jupiter will be above the sun towards the left, and if you're really lucky, you may even be able to capture Comet 12P Pilus Brooks during the eclipse, which will be close to Jupiter as it is in orbit around the sun this month. Now, that would be a truly spectacular shot. But folks, most importantly, remember to enjoy the experience of watching a solar eclipse firsthand. And yeah, actually don't be too caught up with capturing the sun and also try to appreciate the beauty and wonder of the solar eclipse. Now, I'm actually in Europe, so I can't see the eclipse firsthand, but I want to wish all my viewers who are going to watch the eclipse, like Kurt from AstroQuest 1, Frank Roberts, Catherine Grimes, Bill Vinson, Perry, and many others, clear skies. And I do hope you will see an amazing show. I also want to express my gratitude for all the folks who support my passion for astrophotography by joining my YouTube channel. I should do this more often, so I want to thank Gary Freemeyer, Suhail Salim, Robert Gales, Jeff Thompson, Vijay Kantamani, Willis Sutherland, Ruth Niewald, John Davies, and all others who have joined my channel as an Astro Coffee supporter. Thank you so much. And let me tell you that by joining the channel, you'll gain access to some exclusive video content about planetary imaging, and you'll receive all my astro photos in high resolution format. And as channel members, please feel free to ask me any kind of questions about, about astro cameras, telescopes, telescope mounts, how to track and capture objects in the night sky, or how to process your images or anything else. I'll attempt to answer them. Just send them to astroforumlive at gmail.com and I'm actually also considering starting a bi-weekly exclusive Q&A live stream uh, for my channel members. So let me know if you think that would be beneficial for you. And please send me your questions. All right, so let's move on to discussing Comet 12P Pons Brooks. At the time of this video, this amazing comet is currently approaching the Sun and it can be found in the constellation Pisces. So, just after sunset, when you look towards the west where the Sun has just set, you might be able to spot this comet in the evening sky with the naked eye during the first few weeks of April. Now, you'll certainly be able to spot it with some binoculars or a telescope. So folks, I have to confess that I have been pretty foolish because I didn't attempt to photograph the comet in early March when I did have some clear skies. And currently we have been experiencing some weeks of cloudy skies and I haven't had another opportunity to capture it. So I'm really hoping for that Easter miracle so that I can still capture the comet in the first week of April because after that first week it will become increasingly challenging as the comet approaches what is called peri Helion, which is its closest point to the Sun, and that will be on the 23rd of April. And by then, the Sun will certainly outshine the comet. So during galaxy season, which spans from spring to summer, constellations such as Leo, Vitigo and Ursa Major dominate the midnight sky in the Northern Hemisphere. And these constellations provide a gateway to observing awe-inspiring galaxies that are millions and sometimes even hundreds of millions of light years away. And while capturing distant galaxies with a telescope often requires a large aperture and a long focal length telescope, there are still plenty of opportunities to photograph groups of galaxies with shorter focal length telescopes. For example, 
the Leo triplet in the constellation Leo offers a captivating view of three galaxies that are approximately 35 million light years away. And I was able to capture this triplet with my 80 millimeter aperture and 600 millimeter focal length telescope. Another great example is Mercarian's chain. Now this chain of galaxies is located about 15 million light years away and it's a fantastic target to capture with an 80 millimeter aperture and a 400 millimeter focal length telescope like I did in this picture. And another rewarding combination is M81 and M82, also known as Boat's Galaxy and the Cigar Galaxy. And this pair is situated in the constellation Ursa Major. Now, if your main aim is to capture individual galaxies at high resolution, you do need that large aperture and long focal length telescope. For example, I captured M51, that's the famous Whirlpool galaxy, in the constellation Canis Venatici using telescopes with varying focal lengths. So let me give you that example. Here you can see the galaxy at 600 millimeters focal length, at 1400 millimeters focal length, and the final picture is the Whirlpool galaxy at 5600 millimeters focal length with raw data I bought from a 70 centimeter aperture Ricci Kecia telescope located on a mountaintop in Spain. Now, in that 5600 millimeter picture, I could even see galaxies that are hundreds of millions of light years away and they appear as tiny blobs in that image. So I've kept the most challenging topics for the end of this episode, which are the Lyrids meteor shower and also the positions of the planets in April 2024. Now the Lyrids meteor shower is a moderate strength event that occurs annually between April 16th and April 25th. And this year the Lyrids will reach their peak on the night of April 22nd. And typically they produce about 18 meteors per hour at that peak under dark clear skies. But unfortunately, the viewing conditions for the Lyrids meteor shower this year are unfavorable due to the presence of an almost full moon shining brightly around the time of the peak. It may be possible to catch an impressive meteor or two and the radiant point will be situated between the constellations Lyra and Hercules. Now, additionally, the planets will be positioned low on the horizon, particularly for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere. But if you enjoy observing the planets, April 10th may be of particular interest to you, as there will be a close approach of Saturn and Mars above the Eastern horizon in the morning, just before sunrise. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to put on those sunglasses to safely enjoy the eclipse and see you in the next video.